So today's video is going to focus on speciation. And speciation is really just the formation of a new species. Okay, so we have a population, and for some reason that population has been separated. You can see that happening here in the insect population. And that reason could be a physical barrier. You know, there could be a river, you know, river flow direction, uh, mountains, um, the formation of the Grand Canyon. You'll see that as an example that we have in just a minute with the squirrel population. Okay, but for some reason, a portion of the population becomes isolated. And so they are no longer interacting with this other section of the population. Okay, and because they've now been physically separated, there may be slightly different environments. And so if the environment is a little bit different, there may be different traits that are uh, favored in one particular em environment. We talked about natural selection. So if these two populations that started off the same ended up being physically separated or iso isolated from one another, okay, and, there are a, and they're in two different environments now, like I said, natural selection and various pressures could result in the populations now changing, that some alleles are favored over the other. And if this occurs over a long period of time, then the, uh, then the organisms now may no longer be able to interbreed, which would result in a new species. Okay, so let's walk through an example of this happening. Okay, so um, first let's get a little vocabulary down again. Okay, so a species is going to be um, organisms that can interbreed and produce viable offspring, okay, viable fertile offspring. Not just offspring that can survive, but they need to be able to have babies as well. Okay, for example, um, a horse and a donkey can interbreed and they can produce um, a, they can produce a child and they can produce a viable child. They can produce a mule. However, that mule okay, is infertile it cannot have children. So that keeps the horse and the donkey as two separate species, okay? So, because they are unable to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. So when speciation occurs, um, like I said before, we've now formed a new species, okay? And so if you look at some of these pictures, we can kind of see this happening. So the example that we're gonna look at here are finches. And a finch is a kind of bird. Okay, and you can see I've got the uh, Galapagos Islands here. A lot of you guys have heard of this, and you've heard of um, Charles Darwin. Okay, he's the one that first proposed some of the theories of evolution. So I have here what's called a founder species. Okay, and the founder species, as a general rule, um, when we talk about island speciation, usually comes from the mainland. Okay, and it'll land on one of the islands. So let's say it landed on this island. Okay, and eventually over time, some of these will start to migrate. And what this is what happened with the finches. They started to migrate to the different islands. And so as each, as this finch settled on these various islands, all those islands were different. Okay, so on each island, there was a different environment. Okay, there's different food sources available. Okay, and so there has, the finch has to be able to get all the different kinds of food. And so uh, these populations over time became isolated. And in a certain area, it was depending upon the food source, the beak on a finch makes a difference. Okay, so if you notice, if you look at these, you can see that they all have um, slightly different beaks. Okay, usually a shorter, wider beak um, is better for cracking open nuts and seeds. Um, a longer, thinner, narrow beak like this one up here would be better for um, trying to get flower nectar. Okay, so depending upon the food source, it was better to have a certain type of beak. And so those birds that were born, remember you have to be born with it, those birds that were born with that particular beak were able to get food better. And so they're the ones that reproduced. And over time, as natural selection worked on these birds, you started to see a shift in the population. And eventually, that can lead to, again, our speciation, the formation of all of these different types of finch. You have five different finch pictures down here. They are all a different species. 
they can no longer reproduce with one another and produce fertile offspring. Okay, so this would be an example of island speciation occurring. So these various finches are on these different islands, they're isolated from one another, they have different food source, and eventually the population shifted so much okay, that they are no longer able to interbreed with one another. Okay, so here would be another example of speciation. Okay, so originally, okay, these squirrels were the same species. Okay, and they lived together. Okay, and over time, as the canyon was formed here, okay, you had one squirrel population that ended up on one side and one that ended up on the other side. Well, again, these are, and this is the Grand Canyon. This is not just any canyon. It's not like a ditch. Okay, this is the Grand Canyon. So this is a little tiny squirrel. None of these squirrels are going to run down this side, go across, come up this side to find a mate. So these populations became isolated on each side of the canyon. And the environment on each side of the canyon, again, was different. And so by being in this different environment, different alleles were favored. Different traits were favored in these different environments. And so those are the, organism, those are the uh, squirrels that had these different traits that were able to survive and reproduce. And eventually, like we said before, speciation again occurred. These squirrels, if you put them together, if you put a male and a female of the white-tailed antelope squirrel and the Harris's antelope squirrel, let's say you had a male Harris's antelope and a female white-tailed antelope, they would not be able to reproduce and produce a viable offspring. Let's look at some adaptations then, or some different um, uh, variations. Like I said, some adaptations that would be helpful for a different, you know, different varieties of organisms. We've looked some with plants, and okay, we already looked at plants when we did our projects, and we talked about, you know, how prairie grasses need to be flexible in the wind and wind pollinated. So let's look at some animal adaptations that, in certain environments, would be helpful. Okay, so we're first going to look at uh, what are called defensive adaptations, so things more for protection. Okay, so you can see things here like armor or shell, you know, like the snail has a shell, the armadillo's armor, the shell on a tortoise, those will all help obviously with defense, make it harder to eat the organism. Uh, things like tough skin, okay, tough thick skin, um, horns or a tusk. Okay, those can also act as defensive mechanisms okay, and to try to fend off predators. Other defensive adaptations could also be things like on plants. And you've got thorns or spines on plants, poisons or toxins both on plants and animals. Okay, and a lot of your poisonous animals will be very brightly colored and it will act as a warning system also to deter um, things from eating them and discourage predators. Okay, some other um, adaptations that could also be defensive as well as predatory uh, would be things like mimicry, which is more defensive, and camouflage. Okay, so your mimicry is when something is copying something else. A lot of times you'll see a non-poisonous um, organism copy a poisonous one. So that things that know, for instance, that know this coral snake is poisonous, at a glance you might think that that is a coral snake as well. And so then you will eat the king snake. You can see over here you have these variety of um, four insects here that are all mimicking these poisonous wasps here. Okay, camouflage. They're working to blend in better with their environment. So you can see here you've got some organisms that are possibly hiding from predators, okay, blending in with their environment. But you can also have a predator that will lie in wait for their prey, okay. This fish is actually here, okay, and it will essentially pop up and it will eat, okay, its prey. So camouflage can work both ways, both as a predator um, concealment as well as prey also being hidden from the predator. Okay, so in, in addition to defensive mechanisms, you can also see behavioral adaptations. Okay, behavioral adaptations can also help the organism to survive. Okay, things like um, herds, pack mentality, um, migration, okay, where organisms uh, move whether based for resources or for reproduction, like these organisms. But those can also be beneficial to a particular population. In addition to the camouflage, predators may have some particular adaptations that help them as a predator. Things like uh, claws and fangs, uh, venom. Predatory birds are going to have a sharper beak. Okay? Uh, many of them have sharp talons. Okay? Things that will help them catch and um, hold on to prey better. 
spores will also have some adaptations of their own that help them to uh, consume the plants better. Their teeth are going to be very different than a predator's teeth. And you'll notice they don't have any of the long, sharp teeth. They have more uh, larger, flatter teeth that help them grind and squish up the plants. The beaks on a herbivore bird will be a little bit different, like we mentioned on the finches. Some of the beaks that are thicker and shorter so they can crack open nuts and seeds better. And we've already discussed a num number of plant adaptations when we did those projects over the ecosystems. Okay? And we looked at the various biomes and how um, maybe in a grassland it may be better to have wind pollination. Um, you've seen how some organisms are pollinated, some plant organisms are pollinated by animals. Okay, whether they eat the fruit and spread the seed, or in this instance, the burr that sticks to the animal. Um, areas where there's not a lot of sun, okay, they may have big, broad leaves so that they can do a lot of photosynthesis with the sun exposure that they have. Okay, so you want to make sure you go back and you're looking at that those ecology project notes you took with all those various biomes and the different adaptations that the plants would have in that particular biome so that we can work with these, this stuff in class soon.